Good morning, everybody. Let's begin. Okay. <clears throat> this morning's class is about the concept of worry <clears throat> and what the Kabbalistic uh, interpretations and so on and so forth are. <clears throat> is the sound okay? Yeah, sounds good. Okay, here. fine, let's go. So, <clears throat> there is a verse which states that worry in a person's heart. Uh, here's the verse. One second, let me just share screen and you will see it. There you go. So, this is a verse from uh, Mishlei from Proverbs. And uh, from Proverbs 12, 25, where it says like this, The dag believe ish yashchena, v'davatov yisamchena. Worry in a person's heart wears it down, wears the heart down, or makes it depressed, it suppresses the heart, it makes it depressed. But a good thing, a good word, causes it joy. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> The sages say on this word, this word over here, Yashchena, they explain that it can be read not as Yashchena, but um, as Yesichena. Yesichena, which means um, two things. There are two interpretations. The, the Talmud has two interp interpretations of the word Yesichena. One means to remove it from your heart, brush it aside. <coughs> and the other one is to speak it out, yasiach. Yasiach means to speak it out. So if a person has worries, worries in the heart, he's worried, anxious, and so on and so forth, there are several courses of action open to him. One is to speak it out to somebody else, to speak out the worry, to talk about it, uh, to a friend, a close friend, or somebody who um, will empathize with the person and uh, hopefully be able to hear and understand their problems in an inward kind of a way. And that helps the person. Why does it help the person that way? Because we have a principle. A person is really comprised of two qualities. <clears throat> One is the negative aspect of a person's self, and um, the other is the positive, or in the terminology of Kabbalah, the nefesh habahamit, the animal soul, and the divine soul, the godly soul, nefesh alukit. Now, these two are constantly in a state of, uh, of, of battling um, if anybody wants to look into this more, the whole first part of the book called Tanya is all about that from chapters 1 to about 14. <clears throat> but uh, particularly if you have a look in chapter 12, it discusses this at length, <clears throat> chapter 1 and 2 and then chapter 12. In any event, uh, there's a constant war sort of, going, uh, sort of war going on between these two aspects of a person's self, the positive and the negative. Now, the um, the negative aspect of a person and the neg negative aspect of another person, two negatives sort of cancel each other out. I mean, uh, that certainly works in mathematics and in uh, and in physics, electricity. Two negatives make a positive, but <clears throat> um, in it's not that it makes it positive. It's just that one negative quality, one animal soul, the other, uh, don't, um, the, uh, my animal soul is not effective against yours. <laughs> Let's put it that way. And yours is not effective against mine. So they sort of cancel each other out to a certain extent. Whereas the godly soul, the, the positive aspects of a person, those are much more, um, much more powerful when there's more than one of them. We spoke about this uh, last week, actually. 
when you get together as a group, when people get together as groups, then the, the power of the group can overcome the power of the individual um, to a much greater extent. So even if the group is only two. So two, nef two godly souls against uh, animal souls which sort of cancel them, uh, themselves out uh, is obviously going to be a powerful thing. Therefore, speaking over to somebody who um, has your best interests at heart is one way of getting rid of worry. The other way is to move it aside. As we said before, to move it aside. Now, what does that mean? To move aside or to um, brush aside one's, uh, one's, one's worries. <clears throat> now, there are actually several explanations of this, but um, the explanation that we're going to, let me first tell a sort of a little story and then we'll, we'll understand this a little bit better. <clears throat> a man goes into a bar and he orders himself a drink. And uh, he finishes that one, orders another one, finishes that one, orders another one, and so it goes on. He keeps on ordering more, uh, more alcohol until the barman, the bartender, says, um, "You know, uh, my friend, uh, you're 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 drinking too much." So I say, "Yeah, I know, I know, I know, I'm drinking too much, but I'm trying to drown my worries." <clears throat> and what are you so worried about? So he answers that I drink too much. You see, the, um, that's sort of a higher level of worry. You're worried about being worried. Now, there's a lot of people, unfortunately, that uh, as soon as they start having a worry, a, wor a worrisome thought, then um, they start worrying about the fact that they're worried. And uh, is it abnormal to be worried? It's, no, it's perfectly normal to be worried, but there's things that one can do. The first thing that one can do about it is, as we said, um, Speak it over with a good friend or with a uh, spiritual mentor or somebody, someone like that who has your best interest at heart. That's one way of dealing with uh, worry. Now, there are other ways. There are other ways as well. Um, the sages suggest that when a person has worries in his heart, so... He should do as follows. This is sort of a little a little saying uh, that's <laughs> that's um, uh, very appropriate here. It says like this: <clears throat> There's a book called Pella Yoetz. Pella Yoetz is a book full of advice. It's, it's called Wondrous Advice. That's what it means. Wondrous Advisor or Wondrous Advice. A very interesting book. But he says like this: The past is no longer. The future has yet to come. So where does worry come from then? Now, uh, and, and then the last thing he says, get up and drink a glass of wine. <laughs> but uh, in Hebrew, it makes uh, it all rhymes. So it goes like this. Ha'avar ayin, atid adayin. In other words, it didn't happen yet. Da'ga minayin. Where does worry come from? Kum yayin. Get up and drink a glass of wine. Now, he's not suggesting that one drinks to drown one's sorrows. <laughs> like in that story, that's not going to help very much because eventually you're going to start worrying about the fact that you drink too much. So that's not going to help. But when one thinks about, when one worries about something that happened in the past, that is completely a useless exercise because the past cannot be changed. It really is. It's, it, it's gone. There's nothing you can do about it uh, uh, right now. It's finished. The future didn't happen yet. And because the future didn't happen yet, what's the uh, what's the point of um, of even thinking about uh, worrying about what might be in the future? Just make plans for now to uh, to make sure that today is good, and then it's likely to follow that tomorrow will also be good. And therefore, there's not really that much to uh, to worry about. There's really not that much to worry about. However, the Basic, the basic concept of worrying, if we would um, just if 
we we'll look into it again. Uh, all right, here we go. Um, let me just share a screen here again. One second. I assume you can all see the screen here, yes? Okay. Here, um, in the terms of the Svirot, the chart of the Svirot, worry is associated with the Svira of Netzach. Now, what does Netzach mean? Netzach, in the positive sense, means perseverance, confidence, trust, external security, and internal security to a certain extent as well, although that's more associated with Hod, but we'll get there. Uh, so, it's associated with Netzach. The negative qualities of Netzach are defiance, which we're not talking about now, anxiety, anxiety, stubbornness, and worry. Anxiety, worry, basically the same thing. So that's what we're talking about over here. Anxiety and worry come from the Sphira of Netzach. Now, Netzach is associated with victory. It's sometimes called, uh, usually translated actually, in, in the English it's translated as victory. Now, um, if, you, uh, yeah, if, you, if you think about it, um, victory comes to the warrior, right? The warrior, W-A-R-R-I-O-R, -R -R, warrior, right? Warrior, in the chat box, right? Rather than to the warrior, the warrior with an O. There's a warrior, a, a warrior with an A and a warrior with an O, right? Uh, and um, by being a warrior, we're never going to succeed at anything. And the reason for this is it has to do with a person's mindset. It has to do with the way you set yourself up. You know, things, things happen. These, the lowest we wrote, the lowest we wrote are a product essentially of the higher Svirot. As we explain, explained in one of our previous classes, Moach Shalit Alalev, the mind rules over the heart. According to what goes on in the mind, there will be emotions on, in the heart. Now, it works the other way as well. Uh, emotions in the heart can affect a person's thinking as well. A person, when he's very worried and so on and so forth, it causes his mind to go over and over and over certain scenarios and um, play them out in the worst possible, uh, worst possible way. However, since one has more control of one's mind than one has of one's emotions, the way to control the emotions is indirectly through the mind, through thinking in a certain way, through certain types of thinking. <coughs> the higher faculties, the intellectual faculties, essentially rule over the emotional faculties, and particularly the lower emotional faculties. The high emotional faculties are chesed and gvura, love and awe, and tiferic compassion. Those are the higher emotional qualities. The lower emotional qualities are netzach, hod, and yesod, which we, in, uh, in, in, in our schema over here, we're associating in a negative sense with anxiety and worry, and hold with deviousness, lying, cheating, and so on and so forth. All of them have their um, counterparts. This is available, by the way, this chart is available in the um, Dropbox link, which you can get to from, when you go to the videos tab on the website, kabbaladecoded.com, kabbaladecoded.com. You just go to the videos tab over there, and you say you want videos. Um, you just have to fill out a form, submit it, and it opens a Dropbox link. And you'll find over there a chart of the Svirot and the soul powers. So the inner soul power that we're talking about here, worry is associated with Netzach, with Netzach. But it is possible for the mind to control the heart, in other words, the feeling of worry in the heart. So, say the sages, the way you think is the way your emotions are going to react or in the Yidd the yiddish expression is tracht gut wird sein gut let's look at it from the positive point of view think good and will be good think good you'll feel good think good and things will come out in a positive way now let's think about why uh why that is why thinking positive 
makes the reality different. Not only internally, but the actual reality, the events come out differently. One of the um, interesting um, uh, uh, plays on words, if you want to call it that, it's not really a play on word, that's the way uh, the Hebrew language is designed in a, in a sense. The word for, um, for a crisis, the word for crisis in Hebrew is, I'm just going to write it here in the, in the chat box, mashber. If you want it in Hebrew, it's a mashber. Mashber from the word lishbor, to break, right? A crisis, when a crisis breaks. Now, the, that's, that's the word for crisis, but mashber is also the word uh, for a, what used to be called, I don't think they have them anymore in hospitals, but what used to be called a birthing stool. Birthing stool. Allah mashber, the birthing stool. Now, what's a birthing stool? That was when a woman was about to give babies, uh, about to have a baby, so they would put her on this sort of stool, which I assume had a back on it, but um, it put the woman sort of in a, a, um, a squatting position. It allowed her to squat easily, and um, then the baby would sort of, the pressure of gravity and so on and so forth, the baby would come out easier, and cool down and so on, and open up the whole womb. Anyway, it's called a birthing stool. We don't really have them anymore, but um, I think, but uh, they are available. Could be, in fact, um, the midwives might still use a, a similar kind of a thing. In any event, <coughs> this birthing stool is also... The same word, a mashber, is a birthing stool, I guess because partially because that's how the water's broke and so on. Maybe, it, maybe it's related to that. But in any event, the idea behind it is that a time of crisis, a mashber, is also a time of opportunity. It's a time of birth. It's time for something new. So, if one's attitude, if one's mindset is that in every crisis there is opportunity, in every crisis, there's an opportunity. In every negative emotion or in every negative thing that happens to me from, by, from which I get him, there's an opportunity. Then one tends to look for the opportunities. You tend, you tend to, if, you, if one knows uh, in a very internalized kind of a way that the opportunity is hiding somewhere behind or within this mashbeh, within this crisis, then uh, one looks for the places where it, so to, so to speak, could be hiding, and immediately you try and get your hands around it and, uh, and, and, and bring it towards you. You look for the opportunity within it. If a person is not looking at a crisis in that way, if a person is looking at a crisis as, um, I have to duck my head until, uh, until the crisis passes by, uh, sort of as the expression is in Hebrew, until the anger passes, until the, um, the bad moment passes over, you got your head hidden, you got your head buried in the, you know, buried in the, in the sand or whatever, it's, you know, you're never going to see the opportunities therein. So the opportunity is always there. That's the, uh, the, the basis of this, uh, of this idea. The opportunity is there, just one has to be in the right mindset to be able to bring out of it a positive a positive thing. Um, just to illustrate this, I'll tell a story of the Baal Shem Tov. The Baal Shem Tov was, um, um, it was revealed to him that there was a certain person who embodied the quality of trust. Trust in the sense uh, he trusted in God. The word, the word in Hebrew is bitachon, bitachon ba he, he, he had tremendous, he had tremendous trust in God to to an extent that was very very unusual in the in in, in the world we live in. Uh, this was revealed to the Baal Shem Tov, and he decided that he wanted, in fact, go and see how uh, this person lived his life, so he could learn from him. Mekom malanda, he sculpted from every person, I can learn something, I can learn something positive in my own divine service, in my own spiritual path, I can learn something from everybody, no matter who, even if the person was not necessarily a, a saintly person, 
you can still learn from them. Uh, so he decided that he was going to go and um, observe this particular person and see what it was that um, how he how he lived his life, what he could learn from him. So he went along and he found that the person was, as many people were in those days, uh, the person was uh, an innkeeper. And while he was there, there was a knock at the door, and uh, the um, the servant of the landlord. The landlords usually were like um, dukes and earls and uh, those kinds of people that owned uh, very large estates and they would rent out the um, various um, industries to, you know, whether it was a forest, whether it was a forest for wood or the rivers for fishing or um, um, buildings for inns and so on and so forth and restaurants. So they would rent them out to uh, to various people who would work them, and they would, um, you know, get paid rent or part of the proceeds or whatever. So it so happened that um, uh, this particular person was an innkeeper, and he was renting from a paritz, from uh, from this landlord, from uh, this duke, and uh, the rent was due. The rent was due for the year. That's the way it usually went. You paid a year in advance. So the servant of the duke came to tell this uh, innkeeper, this Jewish innkeeper, that um, it's time to pay the rent. <clears throat> and so I said, okay, and what, uh, when's, when, when, when's the last day that I can pay it? So he told him the day of the week, whatever it was, Wednesday. That's the last uh, day, the, the day that you can pay. And he said, okay. <clears throat> And the Baal Shem Tov, uh, suddenly interested, um, asked him, um, well, do you, have, do you have the money? So he said, no, he doesn't have the money. Uh, but he showed absolutely no signs of worry or of uh, frustration or anything like that. He showed no, no signs whatsoever. So Baal Shem Tov was questioning him more, and uh, he finally found, finds out that he, does, he doesn't really have too many sources of income either, other sources of income. How is he going to pay the rent? He has a family, he has children, uh, they're going to get thrown out, and, uh, you know, how will he make a living? It wasn't so easy, and so on and so forth. All of these things did not seem to worry this particular man at all. Anyway, comes the last day that uh, he has to pay, um, and he makes his way off to the castle of the Duke. Penniless, doesn't have anything in his pocket. Um, he was going to tell him, I guess, that he didn't have the money. So the Baal Shem Tov is watching from the window, and he sees uh, from a distance there's a carriage, a very fancy carriage, coming down the other direction um, towards where this innkeeper is riding on his horse down the road. So um, he sees the carriage stops, and uh, so words are exchanged with the innkeeper, and he sees the innkeeper in the distance um, shaking his head and uh, saying no. And uh, then the innkeeper con gets back on his horse and he continues. Um, the carriage just stays there for, for a while. And then um, the carriage driver uh, unharnesses one of the horses and he you know, races after the innkeeper. And uh, the Baal Shem Tov sees that they make some kind of agreement and shake hands. And, um, and then the, um, the innkeeper goes back to the carriage and the man, the person in the carriage, um, gives him a bag. And um, that's the agreement. And um, off the innkeeper goes and he goes back and he goes to the palace of the Duke. And the man in the carriage um, goes on his way. So... When he comes back, the Baal Shem Tov asks him, what happened? How, what, what did you tell the Duke? So he said, no, I gave the Duke all the money. And where did you get the money from? Well, as I was on the way, uh, one of the other Dukes from uh, the, neighboring, uh, the neighboring area um, came to me and he asked me if I, have, uh, any, if I have any vodka to sell him. He would make vodka, this innkeeper. So I told him, yes, I have. How much do you need? He said he needs 10 barrels because he's making a huge party for his daughters getting married and he's making this very, very big party and he needs 10 barrels. So, yeah, he said, yeah, I have that. How, what's, uh, 
I saw the uh, the other um, the um, the man in the carriage. What's your price? He asked him, "What's your price?" He told him what the price was. He says, "No, I'm not going to pay that. That's too much." He said, "Okay, uh, so I guess you'll find somewhere else." And off he went. Um, but they eventually chased after him and uh, gave him all the money that he asked for, and they made a deal, made an agreement, and he sold the vodka uh, to the to the duke, uh, the neighboring duke, and he went to pay his rent, and everything would be everything was fine. So I managed to pay his rent. Now the Baal Shem Tov then understood like what this uh, what this means, like what not worrying about things means. In other words, you're putting yourself completely, <laughs> in a sense. You're putting yourself completely, yourself completely out of the picture, and the only picture there is you're in God's hands. He'll take care of it. Now, for the average individual, this is going to be a very difficult thing to do. Obviously, it's difficult for us to do things without planning ahead uh, and without, um, uh, you know, some sense of um, some sense of worry. However, as we said before. If you think about it, you can divide the worry into three sections. Worrying about the past, totally useless. Absolutely not no, of no benefit whatsoever because you're not going to change it through worrying. So one third is off. Worry about the future. Don't worry about the future. We don't know what the future is going to bring, what's going to change, what's going to happen, what's going to uh, be different tomorrow. So let's not uh, worry about the future. That's another third of the worry gone. If you're going to be worried, at least only worry about the present, making sure that the present is the way it should be. What can I do? What opportunities are there for me in this particular situation? What, how can I turn this crisis into a positive learning experience or into a positive experience or into something that will actually benefit me in uh, the present or in the future, whatever. And that is what the whole concept of, uh, of worry is. Instead of letting worry suppress the heart and make a person uh, depressed, because not only then do you worry about whatever it is that the subject is that you're worried about, but um, you start to worry about the fact that you're worrying. And that, you know, second level worry already, is, uh, you know, second order worry is, uh, is, is very debilitating. So, Instead of being debilitated, what we need to do is, first of all, talk to a good friend or to a counselor or to a, um, um, a spiritual advisor and so on and so forth, a spiritual leader uh, that, uh, that can understand your situation and sympathize with it and, uh, and empathize with it rather. And um, together you could find a way out of the current crisis. But the second thing is move it aside. How do you move it aside? By understanding that there is a positive, that a positive attitude can change the whole situation. If you think positive, that the end result is going to be positive, you will look for the opportunities in the situation rather than um, worry about how the opportunities are going to overcome you. There's a concept called um, in in uh, Hasidic parlance, in Hasidic um, uh, slang, so to speak. There's a concept called the chatchila ariber, going over the top from the outset. To go over the top from the outset. Now, what does that mean? When one comes across a barrier, something that's in your way, something that's blocking you, whatever that blockage may happen to be. So there's three possibilities. One is you'll sort of lower your head and wait until times change, until things change for the better. In other words, sort of hide away from the problem until it disappears. The second is find a way of skirting the problem, you know, uh, sort of going around the barrier somehow or another. And the third possibility is to jump over it from the beginning. Now, to jump over it from the outset means essentially to put oneself in a higher frame of mind so that the barrier is something below you. In other words, to lift oneself up to that higher level in order to um, ensure in order to ensure that the um, uh, that the barrier is no longer a barrier. This is what the rest of the verse says. 
where a worry causes a a, a, a person's heart to um, to become worn away, to become uh, um, to become depressed. A good thing causes it to be joyful. So by focusing not on the negative qualities and on the, uh, the, the, the negative possibilities that can come out of a uh, situation, by focusing on the Davar Tov, on the good words, on the good possibilities, on, the, uh, on, on, what, might, on what might work, that causes the heart to be in a state of joy. When you're in a state of joy, you can jump over the barrier uh, from, the, from the outset. You can jump over it. There is an expression which is used in uh, the coaching um, community, which is called watering the flowers, not the weeds. And that's a very similar idea over here. Yes, there are always going to be problems. We're, we're, we're going to face issues. There's always going to be weeds that have to be dealt with. Now, there's two ways in making the garden grow. One is to simply remove the weeds. But removing the weeds is not really enough. It, gives, it, it might give the flowers a chance to grow. It gives them more space to grow. But you still have to nourish the flowers. So instead of watering the weeds, in other words, focusing on the negatives and causing the negatives to grow more and more, instead of worrying about worrying, which is adding negative upon negative, just start watering the plants and not the weeds. If it's possible, remove the weeds. But at least water the plants and don't water the weeds. In other words, water the positive things, make these more dominant in a person's life, more um, um, part of um, one's focus, rather than the negative things which cause one to focus on... Uh, on despair and on hope, hopelessness and on uh, anxiety and so on and so forth. And those obviously are self-destructive. Um, I'm going to stop here because I have to uh, go somewhere a little early today. Um, let me just see a couple of questions. Um, Worry about worry develops from proprioceptive cause, uh, cues and by feedback from sensation to panic. Anyone who crosses the threshold to panic will experience as watering the flowers is effective from mild to moderate. Um, yeah. Um, Terry, it is true that there are uh, possibly genetic and biochemical propensities towards worry and so on and so forth. But... As we know from, uh, from many, many experiments, the levels of um, positive chemicals in the, in the blood, uh, like dopamine, serotonin, um, are very much affected, are very much affected by um, what goes on in a person's, uh, what goes on in a person's mind. Uh, in fact, to such an extent that there are methodologies, as you know, psychologists rather than psychiatrists, but psychologists uh, try and change a person's mood in order to change the chemical uh, structure. The chemical structure automatically kind of follows, um, as, you, as you probably know. Um, it's true that someone who is in a, uh, in a state of total panic uh, may need some sort of strong intervention, um, possibly a medical intervention of some sort or another, a drug intervention. But we're not talking so much about people who are in, in, in that kind of stage of panic, but much more people who are like all of us every day, you know, a person experiences situations which may cause worry and so on. And the way to deal with it is hopefully not with drugs because then, um, you know, you start with uh, one drug, at least the next drug and so on. And it's like there's no end to it, uh, as you probably know. But the way to do it is sort of to Im improve the mood. I mentioned in, in a previous class that um, um, a person can even use certain facial expressions 
to cause various positive chemicals to start flowing uh, in the body much more. For example, um, um, there's uh, something called... Um, there's a certain type of smile, the Duchenne smile, which is um, a smile that a person is able to, uh, where, where he feels it from the sort of the bottom of his heart, so to speak. It's a real, a real smile, which causes the face to sort of crinkle up, and even the side, you know, the crow's feet at the sides and uh, the sides of one's eyes, the ocular muscles are involved, and a real smile like that causes positive, positive chemicals to 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 start flowing, positive. Um, uh, hormones and so on and so forth, hormones and chemicals in the body. And that's a perfect, perfectly natural thing. The same is true with laughter, as I mentioned before, uh, also that there, there are certain um, methodologies that use laughter as a sort of panacea, as a cure for uh, various, types of, um, uh, various types of depression. So there are things that one can do. Uh, in a physical sense, without having to go the drug route. But um, as, uh, as Wendy said, yeah, simple idea, keep your mind on what you want to have happen, not on, on, not, not on what you don't want to have happen. That's right. I mean, that's basically the idea that we're talking about now. Uh, good with sein good. If you think about the good aspect of it, that will help. Uh, in the book of Daniel, the advisor in the song felt threatened. Uh, Yes, that, uh, that did, yeah, that uh, the Megillah talks about that, that uh, everybody else was worried and Daniel, um, uh, he was the only one that saw, um, but their souls saw, so to speak, yeah. Um, right. Yeah, uh, I speak only for those born with feel guilty that they can't use these methods. I'm like, yeah, okay, very good. Okay, so that's more or less uh, that's more or less the idea, uh, folks. That there, you know, nothing's ever um, so black and white and um, so negative that we can't have a positive effect on on ourselves. But it, but it requires a mindset. Now, that mindset. Don't wait until the crisis happens, until the panic attack starts, until the worry sort of sets in before getting the positive mindset. It's much more difficult to do it when there's already a, a person is already in a state of worry, in a state of anxiety. Prevent the anxiety before it comes in. Uh, yes, that's that's exactly the verse. Cast your needs upon the Lord, rely on Him; He will take care. That's exactly right. Yeah. Give um, um, uh, 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 place on your place on God your 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 issues. Let Him take care of them. And not only that, but who Yichalkalecha means He will nourish you. But he will nourish you. Who you chalkalecha? Just let me write it in the uh, in the uh, in the chat box here. Who you chalkalecha? You chalkalecha. Who you chalkalecha? Which means he will nourish you, or he'll sustain you, or he'll look after you, he'll take care of you. So this word you chalkalecha over here in the Hebrew. I didn't, the word in the Hebrew is related to the word kli. So I say, just say that he will give you the means. The word kli means a vessel. He'll give you the vessels and the means to take care of things. But what? You have to be on the lookout. You have to be on the lookout for solutions, not on the lookout for the problems. Unfortunately, the way we always look at things, and we, I think we taught this from uh, you know, Freudian background and scientific backgrounds as well and and you know people in engineering and so on and so forth they're always taught when you have a machine you look for the problem you solve the problem but with human beings it doesn't really work that way instead of analyzing and analyzing and analyzing the problem things are so complex that to find the reasons and the causes of the problem and 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 analyze the problem to death is not really the best way to go. Generally, the best way to go is to start looking for the solutions rather than the problem. In other words, I'm in this situation. What can I do to get out of it? What's the next step? What's the one little thing I can do to improve the situation, to make it look better? 
How do I know that? So there's, um, uh, I'm sure many of you are familiar with, uh, with this approach. Uh, it's a psychological approach which um, was um, based on the work of uh, Milton Erickson and then later Steve DeShazer and various others um, where they, they, they look at what, uh, they, they tell the client, the patient, to look at what will things look like when the problem is solved? How will things look? How will things be? What will be different? What will you first notice when the problem is solved? And then, what does that do? That gets a person into thinking about the, the, the solved problem, and then you can work a little bit backwards from there to where you are. In other words, work in terms of the solution rather than in terms of the problem. And that is, um, yes, that's correct, Shelley, exactly. Um, <laughs> there is <laughs> the car of a poor client is breaking. <laughs> okay, right. Once I eat, right, a miracle. <laughs> that works. I don't know for how long, but it works in the meanwhile. Um, good. Okay, folks, uh, I think we'll call it a day. Um, if that's